Good morning. Can you hear my voice, right? Yeah. Okay. A very good morning, everyone. So we are come to webinar today. I think this is the last for me to host such webinar on behalf of my faculty. So let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Dr. Mung Wei I'm from the Faculty of Engineering, Masa University. Okay. Let's look at the webinar today. So the conceptual design of tall building in Malaysia. So. When we see the tall building, right? In other terms, we also can call it as a high-rise building, right? So nowadays, we can see the building is getting taller and taller, not only in Malaysia, but also worldwide. So the construction of high-rise building become very popular nowadays. So when we design a tall building, right? So actually, we need a good engineering judgment. Therefore, the structural performance of the tall building is very important, right? Therefore, in this webinar, a general conceptual uh, design of tall building will be first uh, focused. Then also we also discuss the typical tall building system adopted in the industry, together with the structural building, the analysis, and also the performance performance checking they are required for a tall building design. Okay, so before that, let me introduce our speaker today, Mr. Kung Fu Xiong. So he is currently a uh, Structural Manager at the JMP uh, Bridges and Building Central Perhat. So actually, Mr. Kun is is my junior during our university life. Also, we are also quite close to each other. We are conducting research uh, as a team during last time, uh, long time ago, I think around 10 years, 10, 10 years. Yeah. So he obtained the bachelor degree in 2015. Then he further his, master, his master uh, in the structural engineering. So currently, he also applied for the professional engineer title. So I think hopefully uh, within a month, I think he can get the title. Okay. So without further ado, let me welcome Mr. Kun to present his talk on the conceptual design of tall building in Malaysia. Okay. Thank okay, you, Mr. Uh, Kun. Okay. You can start when you're ready. I, I will stop to share my screen. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Moon, for your kind word and introductions. Okay, uh, without further delay, I think I will share my screens. Just hold on a second. Yeah, I hope the, all the audience and maybe Dr. Moon, can you check that? Can you guys see the screens? So if everything is okay, so I will start my presentations. So uh, as introduced by Dr. Moon, so I'm going to, I'm, Mr. Kun, uh, so I'm from GMP Bridges and Building, and um, today my topics I'm going to share with you guys is the conceptual design of the tall buildings in Malaysia. So at first, why do we need tall buildings? And then we know that in Malaysia, there's a lot of tall buildings that are happening around us, such as the PMB 118, the Exchange 106, which and the height is shown here. So Pratona Twin Tower, which already be the tallest building for about 10 years before super, uh, taken over by the uh, Burj Khalifa. And then we had the Four Seasons Hotels and the Telecom Tower and much more. So it's not too difficult to see that more and more tall buildings are mushrooming, especially in the KL areas. So why do we need that? Of course, the reason, the key reason will be the urban population growth, limited land arrivals, and then like a, a busy cities like KLs, we, more and more opportunities, working opportunities are created. So for the existing of the tall buildings, enhance the availability of the livings and the working space. And lastly, not last but not least, the needs of distinctive landmark. So I think everyone is now be, be very proud of our tall buildings 
like for years already, such as the Petona Stream Tower. And now we have the current tallest buildings, which is a Merdeka PMB 118. But when we talk about the tall buildings, there is some considerations that always taken into account by our clients and developers. First will be the financial constraints, the budgets or the fees. So to construct a tall buildings, definitely we need a lot of money. So as a consultant for the clients, we need to come up with an effective structural design that can ensure the structural performance, safeguards the structural design so that it will not collapse. Of course, we need to take care of the client's budgets. And then what does the client's perceive, perceive value? So what can the client get? Of course, the most important, the needs of the distinctive landmark. So when we talk about the Petronas Twin Towers, we talk about the KL 108, everyone knows about Malaysia. So it's in, it directly give a good name to the clients. So, and then how do we best communicate our ideas? So nowadays we talk about the BIM. So the building information modeling systems. So we, with the 3D modelings, all the consultants, not only consultants, contractors and the clients can communicate better because we can view the things in 3Ds. And next, are specialists required? This question arises because when the building is getting tall and taller and taller, the key driving parameters for the structural design will be the wind. So back to the questions, are the specialists required? The answer is yes, because wind tunnel specialists need to come in for the tall building design. So we can further talk about that in a later stage. Mr. Kun, Mr. Kun, uh, yes? so, so sorry to disturb. Uh, I think the, the slide is still the first slide. Oh, sorry. Uh, let me oh, share yeah. again the slide. Uh. Yeah, because the slide is not moving just now. <laughs> yeah. uh, can you see the slides now? So uh, am I showing the correct slides? The client developers considerations? Now, now the slide is the white tall buildings. I think um, it's the third slide. Okay, let me try again. Uh, are you seeing the client developer considerations? Uh, no, it's still the third slide. Okay, let me try the PDF instead of the presentation slides. Okay. Can you see the slides, uh, Dr. Moon? Ah, uh, yes. Now, oh, is, this is the PDF, right? Yeah, this is the top Yeah, PDF. yeah, yeah. This is the PDF. <laughs> okay. 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 So, where are we now? Yeah. So, um, next, we need to know who are the key drivers for the top buildings, constructions, and the design teams. Why is this important? Because with the good engineering background and project related background on the core building design teams is important because they have the experience on how to design it. Not only that, for the construction teams, so we need someone who are very, very in, specialized in building the tall buildings. Like for, if for example, uh, KL118, so we, if we are asking some contractors who are not experienced in that field of constructions, so it will be a disaster, I would say to everyone because they have no experience in building the super tall buildings. Like how are they going to deliver the high strength concrete from the very low ground level to the very high levels, such as the, at a height of 400 meters high. So, and lastly, we need to know what we know and what is unknown because in terms of structural engineering wise, like uh, for wind engineering aspects, for examples, so the wind expects the wind dynamics is very important for tall buildings. So if for the effects of vortex and gallopings, if those effects are not being addressed, 
So it will be a nightmare for the structure design. It might cause under design for the super tall buildings like KR118. So we, after we talk about the client considerations, we, so before we go to the conceptual design of the tall buildings, we need to know in terms of the engineering management wise, what do we, what are the inferences that can cause to the, before we manage the conceptual design. So first is we need to know what is the client and the architect visions. So why is this important? Because the architects or the client visions is driven the whole projects to go on. So if the client wants something like the distinctive landmark to have some things can deliver out, but engineer says cannot. So this is something so we need to think about that. And then what is the physical site constraints? If the buildings are going to build at the at the site with a limited space for constructions, there will be a problem too also. So not only that, then when we talk about the what underneath about the physical sites like the soil profile, the is it the built at the Kenny Hill profile locations? So those are need to be addressed. Then how does other discipline impact on the structural design? So because my main topic is about the conceptual design of the tall buildings, so I will be focusing on the structural design. But of course, we, we can't deny that we need to coordinate with other disciplines like the MNE and the uh, fires. So those design criteria need to be taken a, into account when we sizing up our our structural element for the tall buildings. Next, which is the what is the structural performance required of the buildings? So this topic where I will talk about it in the later slide because for a tall building, it will need to perform into a certain degree of safety so that it will not cause or it will cause certain degree of damage that is acceptable in terms of structural wise or architectural wise. So this will be discussed in the later slide. And then what is the pro project program? So this is much important in the overall from the design stage to the construction stage of the project of the tall building. This is because if we don't have the project timeline to chase, so it will cause the client to lose some money because Time is go. Okay, lastly, uh, what is the local market and will this affect our design? Not, not to deny that there are a lot of uh, tall building happening around us and be, being constructed, especially in the KL area. So more or less that uh, most of the clients know what are they doing and maybe they, they don't. So at least we no, need to know what we are designing is up to the design standards and if we are the one who are correct in our design, so we need to defend and we need to voice out the correct procedures so that good engineering judgment can be secure. So of course, lastly, uh, why is the engineering challenge? Like I say, when the top building is getting taller, so the wind effects is getting more important. For example, the vortex and the galloping effect. Okay, next, when we, after we talk about the engineering management, now we need to talk about the design the prelim design. So of course, in the engineering design team, we need to ask ourselves, have we designed this kind of building before? If no, we need to seek for someone who has the experience to join the team so that uh, the whole design it will be more secure and the structure analysis will be more accurate. Next, we have we reviewed the loop path horizontally and vertically? This is important because like, for example, low-rise building, low-rise buildings, in uh, particularly in Malaysia, so only the gravitational loads has been considered. But when the building is getting taller, so not only the notional load is important, but the wind. And not to forget, in cer certain of the states in Malaysia, seismic is also important as the authority, local authority require on that. Next, is there anything special about the building? Of course, yes. Uh, like for examples, uh, KL one KL one one eight. So we can see that the shape of the tower itself is quite very very unique. So we need to think about the localized effect and what is the potential effect and the stresses that being developed along the mega truss that secure the building stiffness. So when we talk about all these things, then we need to think about the 
conceptual design. So can we simplify the concept design to avoid unnecessary secondary effect on the building, the structures? So when, when we talk about the tall buildings, P delta effect is one of the key driven factors, secondary effects that can cause bigger design moment or the bigger design forces to, to that can cause the structural member to be become bigger size. So if we can control that, so we can not only help the clients or architects to reduce the structural size and increase the net floor area, the NFA, but also will re, uh, help to reduce the cost of the constructions. Next, is there any need for the additional research? So this question raises when the building shape is very, very unique. Uh, maybe it's like one one KR 118 or some of the buildings, tall building in the overseas, like the CCTV buildings in China. So the shape is very, very unique. So not only the wind tunnel need to be taken, but some of the re additional research that need to need the assistance from the university or the research body to help to do the research to get the more accurate results. Then what are the risks and the opportunities? So when we talk about risk of the buildings, so we often call, talk about the collapse mechanism. So the collapse mechanism need to be studied under the dynamic impacts, such as the earthquake, the wind, or maybe the blast. So what are the opportunities? So the opportunity is, okay, of course, the design team will gain a new knowledge that can they have never learned before. So how can we rationalize the design? So when we talk about the optimizations of the tall buildings designs, let's say in the structural member sizing, so we need to rationalize the size along the floor or the along the height of the buildings. So this is important because when we talk about the IBS constructions, so standardizations of the size can help to reduce the carbon footprints. So rationalize the design is very important also. And then what skills are required to achieve the client requirement and engineering intentions? So this is come back to the questions on what is the skills that each and every engineer that can, then they are required to process in terms of the skills, the technical skills, communications, communication skills, when we communicate with the clients and technical skills, when we do the stru structural analysis and design, what are the knowledge that they are required? So when we talk, after we talk about the engineering design stage, so we need to foresee the buildability of the tall building as well. So if we plan some things in the initial stage, very nice, but in the end, in the end stage, we cannot build it. So it will be an empty top. So when we talk about the buildability, so what are the key sequencing issues we need to address? It's like the site issues, or construction sequence? And then what are the critical items that we need to address during the construction stage? We need to foresee. So critical items like the availability of the materials. If, for example, if we have talking about the mega trust for the, for outrigger system, for super tall buildings, like in the Petona Stream Tower, KL108 or TRX. So let's say we need to have a mega trust sections of steel grade of 460. So in the market, there's no such steel grade. So we need to think, are those materials available? If yes, how can we source it? So those are the questions is very important as it will affect the project timeline. Okay, next. How will the material element being delivered to the site and being erected? So this back to the question of the critical items, because when we, let's say we manage to source the materials and it need to de deliver to the site. So the sec the material definitely will come by, uh, by a big sections. So it, it may be uh, being transported to the site with a big, tr big truck. And then if it need, it need to be erected to the height of let's say 400 meters, from the ground levels, we need to have some certain of the tower crane or the other methods to bring it up. So the strength of the 
contractor chosen are quite very important also. The strength of the background of the contractors for this construction job is very important also. And then what elements are contractors designed? So this cannot run away from the scaffoldings. So when we talk about the big constructions for the like a tall buildings, sometimes we need to design, uh, build the sections or the cantilever platforms from the towers. So certain degree of the scaffold need to prop from the tall buildings and this need to be addressed and designed carefully during the construction stage by the contractor. So what are the temporary works are required and how practical is this? So I think this tie back to the questions I raised just now. Are there any areas that requires alternative methods or sequence to be addressed? So again, this will be back to the, uh, the strength and the background of the contractors. So like I mentioned, if there is any other uh, cantilever structures from the tall buildings, which is at the height of let's say 400 and 500 from the ground level, so a different construction method need to think about that. Lastly, do we undermine or loot any adjacent building. So this is very important because for a building construction, not only top building, but any building constructions or the structural constructions. So we need to take not only taking care the safety of the our site only. So we need to take care of our adjacent buildings as indicated in the BMN laws. So when we talk about the ideas of how to construct, how to design, and what is the considerations for the tall buildings. Next, we, we dive deeper into the concept of the tall building. Next, the next system that we need to be taken care of will be the floor systems. So very often in Malaysia, all the most of the tall buildings, they are either using the floor system, such as the cast in situ RC slab, which is either the bin slab system or the band beam with the slab system or the flat set systems. So why are they choosing that? Because of the first reason will be the suitable for the office and residential uh, hospital or hotel tower and good for fire protections, of course, and flexible for accommodating irregular columns and shovel arrangement. And it can behave as a shell element to provide out of plant stiffness and act as a diaphragm actions against the lateral actions. So if behave as a good shell element which can help to tie the vertical element together so it will be provide additional stiffness for it then it can uh the downside of the cast in situ rc slab system for system is it can cause a heavy foundation design because most of the floor they are to be built by the rc system and the concrete are very heavy compared to the steel structures and then uh, slower construction speed because all uh, need to be cast in situ. So the another system they are very often to adopt in the top building, which is a composite slab system, whereby we can subdivide into steel beam with the metal deck or steel beam with the precast plank or etc. So those floor systems are very often to be used in the office tower. Why? Because uh, it provides a faster construction speed and then it's a lightweight structures. So it will cause a less, lesser foundation load to the foundation. So it will cause a power length maybe to be reduced. And then of course with this, it will save the cost for the clients. But unfortunately for the steel works, it requires placement by the tower crane or any cranes and side connection works or for example, most of the boating and the weldings, they need to be done on site. So this require a good workmanship that to be provided by the contractor. And another downside of the composite step effect, which uh, particularly with the steel and metal deck or the steel with the pre precast plank. So those floor system behave as a membrane element and thus it does not provide or provide minimals out of plant stiffness to be taken care and assist the vertical element to resist the lateral actions. So in most of the time, designer will assume that all the lateral actions to be taken care by the bay moment resisting frame system instead of the different actions that to be provided by the cast in pseudo RC slab systems. So when we talk about floor system, we need to know also 
what are the examples of defective floor system that can cause the floor system within a floor plate and it will not behave as a diaphragm actions to the buildings so that it will assist in the lateral actions resistance. So for example, if we have a moment joint along a floor plate here, and there is another isolation with no sure stiffness to tie the, this, floor, this piece of floor plate with the leaf core. So this leaf core and this floor, this floor plate and this floor plate will not high, uh, highly will not react together as a one floor system. So when we talk about the drive knife from actions, these three piece of the wall, the, the floor system, unlikely will act together with the vertical elements. So the out of plane stiffness that we expect to the floor can provide in actually it does not provide. So it might cause underestimates for the lateral deflections of the buildings. So for the next example, which is the voids that discontinue the lateral bracing from the core. So as mentioned just now, our intentions and most of the intentions of the top building design, we need to tie the floor systems with the stiff vertical elements such as the core wall. But we also understand that most of the time, uh, there are many uh, ME ductings or the piping, they will be allocating a surrounding the lift core. So this will cause a discontinuity of the floor uh, loop transfer from the floor systems to the vertical elements. So if we don't provide a localized stiffening design, such as the beam, to tie back the systems to the, back to the core wall or the vertical elements, so this piece of wall at this area, it will not receive a different action effects from the system. So whatever we have been assuming for the structural performance in lateral actions, we might also be under design. Then next will be the limited relative floor stiffness. So considering this is the one of the corridor that most of the high rise have in the residential uh, buildings, such as survey as apartment. So sometimes we will have this narrow corridor without any units at here and this area. So with this kind of situation happens, so the loot will not be effective being shared between this four plate and this four plate. So when there, there is an, an, any lateral actions pushing these directions or this direction or any of the directions, so this narrow uh, corridor will suffer a lot of the lateral stresses. So eventually this area will have a highly cracked potentials and thus in the final products of it, so we, this area will crack and then this four plate and this four plate might not be working together like how we assume the, the design. Next will be the limited shear transfer due to the precast panels. So like I mentioned just now, precast panels, it doesn't provide the out of plan bending stiffness to the vertical element. So when the, there is no out of plan stiffness to the vertical elements, so it will not help in the lateral movement. So when we talk about the floor system, now we need to take care about the lateral system as well. So as recommended by the I struck E, so bracing system is one of the ways that can act in the similar ways to a cantilevering a vertical truss. So typically people will take it from the ground level to the top. So this is the reasons that should be presented at every levels of the structures down to the founding uh, foundation levels so that to make this vertical bracing systems to be effective against the lateral actions. So in additionally, the transfer system that is adopted for this purpose need to be have to have an adequate stiffness. So it is not uncommon to see the bracing system working in a conjunction with other vertical elements to achieve an overall lateral stability of the structures. So we, when we talk about the lateral system, we have the let, uh, bracing systems to be provided by, let's say, RC beam or the steel 
steel beam or steel UC sections. So of course, we will have another system to be provided by the shear wall or the core, the core wall. So those shear wall and core walls, the uh, lateral system are very common in particular for all the residential buildings that dotted in Malaysia. So the rest of the structure is to be built around them and they normally work in a combination of the four plate and the roof things as a diaphragm. So this can also be combined as a steel bracing if the designer wish to do so. So the core generally serves as a vertical access to the entire structures through the lift or the staircase and are usually placed in line with the center of the structures in an effort to reduce the torsional effect. So if we provide the stiff elements such as a leaf core or the shear wall concentrating in one side at the one corner or one side of the buildings. So the in the plan views that we can see this, we can assume or we can calculate the center of rigidity to be one sided. So when the center of rigidity of the building in the plan view is one sided, so torsion effects will take place and the most of the torsion, the vertical elements will need to design for torsion is uh, not favorable to engineering design. So these are the examples that I mentioned in the iStruck ebooks that uh, uh, apart from the bracing system, we have the wall system. And then if we want to not to have those systems, we can use a full moment connection system for a bare frame design or moment connection system with the wall and the bracings or the hybrid in the other directions for the bracing effects. So now still we will talk about the conceptual design before we enter the conceptual design. We need to have some preliminary uh, assessment to identify the, the, the sizing of the column, particularly the column because uh, architects or clients are very concerned, usually are very concerned about that because it will take up the, let's say, the parking space, the usable space that to be used by the client or architect for other functions like the retail mall or the functional room. So the prelim sizing is very important. So I believe some of the audience will be from the consultant firms or others, uh, specialized firms, but uh, not to deny that these methods, uh, column load take down is very uh, one of the conventional methods, a manual calculation method to estimate the columns loads and the sizing. So when we have the column estimations of the loads, they accumulated it. So this is unfactor load. When you factor it, it's about this. So we plot into a PM curve. So we know uh, this size is good for the sizing and you need to communicate with the clients. So these are the com conventional way of doing it. But when we talk about the modern way of doing the, the column load takedowns, so we need to introduce use for the use of the digital engineering. So one of the way is to use the digital tools, which is the Rhino and the Grasshoppers tools. So th those two are very important because uh, it provides the quick calculations. And then if client want to change anything or want to try others options, these two can assist you do the calculation very quickly. Unlike the conventional method, you need to go back to the Excel spreadsheet and then you need to calculate one by one. If they change anything, you need to change it manually. So it will time consuming method, but digital engineering method is very, very fast. What you need to do is you just to have a, take uh, some time to do the scripting so that you will produce some loadings plan for you. So this is a one of a convenient way and a modern way of doing things for the look takedown options. So just now we talk about all the conceptual design uh, before we enter the conceptual design. Now we need to introduce about the tall building systems that commonly adopted in Malaysia. So for take for example, this one of my projects, a residential project, which is a service apartment. So it's very often that the service apartment, you have a show wall system with the RC wall frame. Uh, RC frames and the core wall. So why shear wall system? Because usually uh, architects will use the shear wall to divide the units so that uh, they can divide the unit equally and then uh, arrange their units. So we can, engineers will use the, the division of the units layout to place the whichever the, the 
shared work position they want, of course, and this need to be coordinated further with an architect. So for the apartment part, so we have a shared work system with the lift core wall. And then if the top, the residential building is too slender or underperform in the lateral action, such as the wind. So sometimes we can introduce RC back wall along at, at the mechanical floor of the residential unit. So the E will help to control the lateral dif displacements of the, the buildings. Then it's very often that in Malaysia, so there is a car park or the retail mall below the residential unit. So transfer plate or transfer bin system are required to transfer the loads from the tall buildings to the column below supporting it. So when we talk about this kind of systems, the challenge are we need to design for the transfer structures. So which is uh, very unfavorable to the engineer design because when we talk about transfer structure, it have caused high tendency to cause a soft story under the lecture actions. And then when we analyze the transfer structures, engineers or the designer need to carry out the construction sequence studies. Then let me share about the other projects that I've designed before, which this is an office tower. So this office tower is, if I'm not mistaken, is about 290 meters high. So, so for office tower, we very often we have a core wall also, then we need, then we will have the outrigger frame or the RC frame at the one side. Uh, for this project, so my core wall uh, or being arranged in the edge of the building. So definitely this building was subjected to torsional effect. So because of the center of rigidity to be one-sided. So since I mentioned this building is about 290 meters, if not mistaken, so a localized belt wall is also required for this project. So to tie back the, the lateral displacement of the building. So the challenge is the lift calls play a very important role as a lateral stability system. The floor bin and the floor slab, they are responsible to tie the floor to the stiff element let's say in this case is the core wall, they are required to design under lateral actions. This is important because very often, most of the designer or the engineers will think about the floor system only take the gravitational load. So whatever bending moment and shear force that being designed is just the gravitational load. So if those members are to be taken into account and to be act as a diaphragm, for the tall buildings and assist in resisting the lateral actions, those members need to design for lateral action as well. And then we need to study the locations of the effectiveness of the belt truss systems. So, but uh, very often that uh, if we are required to put some belt truss in along the building height, so very often uh, uh, architects or clients will only allow you to put at the mechanical floors. And then not last but not least, so column shortening effects is one of the key elements need to be addressed for the tall building design. So uh, after I shared all the tall building system that are very uh, common adopted in Malaysia, particularly for those service apartment condominiums and the office tower. So there are some of the lateral brace system that are adopted in uh, other country as well, or maybe in Malaysia as well, so which is the cross brace system in with the V brace, diagonal brace, cross brace with the tension effects only, eccentrically brace and K brace. Those systems are not common to found in Malaysia, but uh, they are very common and found in those high seismic country. So when we talk about the system, then now we need to talk about the lo loading, the structural loading that potentially act uh, towards the tall buildings. So of course, cell weight is one of the weights that need to be considered in not only tall building, but short building as well. And then the superimposed dead load, again, is not only for the tall buildings, but it's also for the low rise buildings. But these are the common parameters that are taught in the industry. And then life load, 
those are the taken from the codes and not only for top buildings, but lower buildings also use the same value. So this is important. For top buildings, uh, we need to take in the effects of the life load reduction because the code allow you to do so to reduce the life load along the building height. So in UBBL or BS code, so they allow a certain percentage to be reduced from the life load. So for example, if your your buildings along the height is residential. So at a certain floor, you can reduce the life load by 10%. Then if you more than 10 floors, so when you do the vertical element design, such as the column and the foundation, you above any, any life load that above the 10th story that you can read, you can use the factors of 0 0.5 for the design purpose. So that is from the UBB and the British code. So what about the uh, uh, Malaysia Euro code, uh, MSEN? So MSEN did, did provide a guideline based on the functional floor usage. So those similar approach can be adopted for life reduction purpose. So when we talk about loot, then this is very important for tall building because tall building are more susceptible and critical in lateral actions. For example, the wind. So before we talk about the wind, we need to know that Mal the Malaysia wind code MS1553, the key thing is the value that provided in the wind speed map is in three second guard speed and is for the 50 years of return period based on the green gotten meta analysis. So there is some limitation for the wind codes in Malaysia, which is about that is only valid for the building at less than 200 meter height. And for information, for if you are using the British code, 300 is the maximum height that you can go for the codes. And then if there any there is any structure with a root span less than 100 meters, so uh, it is only can use for the MS code. Beyond that, Malaysia code doesn't cover that. And then structures other than offshore structures, bridges, and the transmission towers. And it does not cover the roof for the podium buildings below the tall building or, or where in the wall of the tall buildings, there is a sloping edge or edge discontinuity. And it does not cover the wind dynamic effects such as the turbulence, vortex, gallopings, Markov roughness studies, and the micro roughness studies. So is there, if there is any buildings structures exceed the limitation mentioned above, wind tunnel studies is highly recommended to be carried out. So to capture those effects as mentioned here, turbulence, vortex, galloping, micro roughness, and the micro roughness effect. And then uh, we need to talk about the another limitation, which is because top building is very often designed by one of the software that is commonly used in Malaysia consultancy market, which is the ETAP. So the, in the software, they doesn't provide the input based on the Malaysia code. So very often is that Euro code or American code, ASC7 or BS code are adopted for the structure analysis. But when we do that, we need to know, we need to know the Malaysia code, as mentioned just now, is based on the three second gas speed. So for example, if let's say the building is located in KL, so which is about the 33.5 basic wind speed. So after calculations, considering all the profile effects, so it will end up with 41 meter per second. But that is based on three second guard speed. So in order to use it in other codes, for example, the BS code, the BS definition is hourly mean speed. So we need to convert the, the speed from three second gas speed to hourly mean speed. So which is about the factors of 1.53. So if for the Euro code is, if not mistaken, is 10 second, uh, 10 minutes gas speed. Uh, so we need to do the, some conversion on that also before we can use it in the analysis. So this is one of the things that I would want to share because, uh, very common that, and I'm finding it very common, uh, people will make mistake on this thing. So when we talk, of, talk of about the wind engineering, what if the local authority require the building to be designed for the earthquake? So we need to refer to the Malaysia Annex, and then we need to know the PGA 
of the area that we are, the building is going to build. So, so these are the rule of thumbs that are recommended by the real code, but don't take this rule of thumb too as a general rule of thumb because it's highly recommended to study the further effect of the localized soil effect. This rule of thumb is just a guide, but it's not the very certain. So these are the map of the National Annex. And then we need to look, look about the soil type of the site. So in Malaysia, is in, in Malaysia, there are two type of uh, spectra that you need to take in care for the soil effect. First is the absence in the absence of the deep soil effect, and next is uh, in the presence of deep soil effect. So the SI study is very important also. So we, the another lateral route that we need to take in care for the tall building design, which is the notional route. So I believe some some of the engineers or the designer know or don't know about the notional route. So what is notional route? Notional is based on the proportion of the vertical route of the structure that is supporting. So typically they are applied in the conjunction with other loads during the analysis. So notional loads represent the forces that come up, that come about due to the imperfections in the structures. Some materials are more sensitive to this phenomenon than the others. And it is for this reason that the notional loads are linked directly to a material as a structure is constructed from. So in BS, they are, BS recommend that one is taking about 1.5% of the characteristic that loot of the structure itself. But in Euro code, since there is no MSEN versions, so I will take a BSEN as a guide. B in BSEN, however, it recommends about 3%. So in general, so this is one of the schematic guide that the loots that can potentially induce in the tall building design. So which is the, so we have the wind with a terrorist attack maybe, differential settlement, seismic, shrinkage, thermal, gravity, yeah, and so on. So next, when we talk about the top building, we need to talk about the final element analysis. So this, this need to be taken care when we designing the top building using the final element software and with the certain crack factors, they need to be addressed. If we based on the SEI code, we have these factors and we based on EC8, so we have these factors. Not only about that, so final element analysis need to understand about the, the out of plane effect and in plane effect that provided by the shell elements. So I think the time is going the end soon, so I try to skip this one. But final element is one of the way to analyze the tall building because the loop path of the structures is very complex. So we, the most important thing is the designer need to understand what is the one D, two D, and three D frame analysis and in turn of the finite studies. So this is very important for the stresses, uh, loop path, and in subsequently it will cause the differential displacement, stresses, and the flow velocity. So I will skip this. So yeah, this is just the, the, the topics that I talked about. We need to do some conversions. If we use a B, uh, Malaysia code, 33.5, and the, in the end, we use the software to do the analysis, we need to convert it into the hourly mean speed. So I think I will skip this earthquake engineering part. Okay. So we take, now we talk about the structural performance of the tall building. So in the tall buildings, we need to know the dynamic response of the tall buildings. The first very important thing is the model period. So very often that in the tall building design, we need to take care that and ensure, designer need to ensure the first mode, second mode, and third mode of the building analysis need to be in translation in both X and Y direction. And the third, only the torsional direction. So if this happens, so your buildings can say unlikely to subjected to the vertical element unlikely subjected to the torsional design effect. So if let's say your first mode is a torsional design, so you the designer need to aware that either they have to change the layout or configuration so that the center of rigidity and the center gravity does not have any eccentricity between them. So as such, 
without the eccentricity, so your building can control back to the first and second mode to be translation in X and Y directions. So next is the model mass participation ratio. These are important for the seismic analysis of the tall buildings. So code required in most of the code that require that 90% of the model mass need to be considered in both transverse and longitudinal directions. And then I think this is most important is which is the building performance uh, or I would say that the building displacement check. So in I have summarized all the requirements as specified in the code. So these are the limits that are specified by the code. So for any tall building design, either from the 100 meters tall buildings up to the 600, 800 or 900 meters height of the buildings, we cannot run away to comply this kind of requirement under certain de designs or the, com or the structures components. So, but when we talk about limits, what are they representing? So in ASCE or as recommended by uh, this author. So these are the effects of the limits if we exceed it. So for example, it's very often that the, in the BS code or the Malaysia's code or typical the Malaysia buildings that we design for 100 to 500 limits, what it means, what does it mean? So it means the cracking of the partition wall. It will cause the crack of the partition wall and it will not cause structural damage to the structural elements and the architecture elements. But if let's say the building cannot achieve this kind of limits, so we need to push it further to the limit. So let's say we go for one to 300. So what does one to 300 means? So it means it will cause uh, general architectural limits under extreme, the wind, uh, the design winds actions, cracking in the reinforced wall and crack in the secondary member, damage the ceiling and the flooring system, facade damage and cladding leakage. So this information are very important to be discussed between the designer and the client so that they let the client know what kind of limit they're going to allow their building to have to suffer so that a future proper mitigation measure can be taken. So in one of the examples I'm going to show you is by my past project, which is in this project, so if, uh, and this project is undergo wind tunnel test. So in if this, this direction, if the wind blow from the X directions, so these are the limits and this is the actual displacement. So if you can, you can see that the wind, the building deflection in this direction is well within the limits, either from the H to 500 or 400 limits. So however, in this direction, the weak direction the, or the Y directions, the building displacement has exceeded slightly from the H to 400 limit. So I would say that it's, con so after discuss with the client, so it considered to be okay because uh, it will not cause a very uh, high degree of damage to the structure elements. So that is under wind case. How about a seismic? So I have a project for the, uh, sorry, this is inter sorry drift. So same things. And then how about seismic? Seismic need to check the same thing as well also. So when we talk about the structure performance in the building displacement and the inter sorry drift, we need to take care of the P delta effect. So P delta effect is very important as it, it will induce secondary effect as uh, to the moment and to the moment and the absolute that to be induced on the vertical element. So there are two types of P delta effect. One is considered the fracture effect on one, another one to be the shear effect. So what from the figures that illustrate here, you can see that one is bending in the bending direction. One is can consider a soft story actions with the full rigid higher story. So in Eurocode, the Eurocode does recommend some of the calculation method to consider the P delta effect. So at first we need to check about the sensitivity of the P delta effect in both X and Y directions. So if we found out that the certain floor is very sensitive in certain directions, so we need to multiply these factors. For example, this case at the levels 37, we need to multiply 1.21 in all the loop combination design under your uh, ultimate, ultimate limit states. So I did conduct some studies about the comparison, the spatial comparison between the wind uh, under the Malaysia code, uh, British code, notional, and the seismic case. So it appears that the seismic is uh, very governing if the building height is less than 60 meters. So not only that, we, as a designer, we need to know about the overturning moment. 
So lastly, I will talk about some of the case studies that, uh, for example, this case is a Petronas Twin Tower. So in this Petronas Twin Tower, you need not only need to take care about the structural systems, we need to take care about the geometry of the, the tall building because geometry will affect the wind effect that induced onto the buildings under the internal study. So if you, the building have too many, uh, less round, less rounded, so it will have a high chance to have a weak, uh, strong turbulence or stagnant studies, uh, stagnant point or stagnant forces that concentrated in one sharp locations. So these are the key elements that been taken care by the Petronas Twin Towers or Tower 1 or Tower 2. So in general, these systems are using the outrigger system, which have a very stiff core wall surrounded by the circular RC columns. So how does the outrigger system work? We have a reinforced concrete outrigger to tie all the perimeter column rings to the very stiff core wall. So if that is not sufficient, this small tower here will help to tie the tower together so to, it will perform better in the structural performance in the building displacement in the storage study. Yeah. So I think with this, uh, I will end my presentations. Uh, I will hand back the platform to Dr. Moon. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kun, for your time to present in the webinar today. So it's quite interesting talk and also informative, not only for the student, right, but also for those who are working in the industry. So okay, so it's undeniable, uh, undeniable that the high-rise building right is quite uh, popular today. So at the same time, but we're also facing some challenges, right, from the designing stage to the construction stage. So Mr. Kun, uh, can you tell me, tell us about the common challenges that a designer would face when designing the tall building in a conceptual? Stage. Okay, sure. Uh, but before that, I need to share back my screen. Huh? Um, so let me test the mic. Okay, so you can hear me, right? So I believe uh, all the structural performance that I mentioned here is the challenge, but I think the most challenged one is the we need to take in case of the client requirements because everything is taught about the cost. So if we have a very good structure system, but if I see the budget, so we need to do a, what we, how to say, an iterative study so that to achieve what the client wants. So sometimes it will be very time consuming. So time consuming is one of the challenge that most of the designer, I believe they're facing now. So that's why when I talk about the topics. So we have one digital engineering tools that actually can help the en engineer or designer to speed up their construct, uh, design stage so that everything can be done earlier and more study can be done for your structure analysis. That's what I believe. Uh. Okay, um, we still have one more question from the audience, right? So he want to ask about the opinion uh, of Mr. Kun on the uh, structural yes. cracking happened on the LRT Pandaraya Bridge Pier. Do you have any opinion? Uh, actually, I didn't read about the news, uh, so I'm not sure what is the cause. <laughs> but... <laughs> okay, so never mind. So next time, you, I think you can contact with each other. Uh. Regarding oh, sure. to this method, okay. So I think now already twelve o'clock, so it's almost lunch time, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think we can end the webinar today. So for those who still have any question, you can uh directly contact Mr. Kun personally. So I think Mr. Kun will answer the question. Yeah, sure, no problem. Those, yeah. So for those who want to collaborate with Mr. Kun, also can welcome to contact him. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you for your invitation, also, Doctor Moon. Okay, it's okay. So next next time, next time, remember to treat me, uh, for for yeah, lunch. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So see you, Mr. Moon. See you. See you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye bye.